Please welcome Eric Weiss. Gentlemen, CEO invited Philip to come into his office. He said, Philip, you've always been a solid performer at our company. You're always here on time. You always leave five minutes after five, unlike some of the other people who are running out of here at the time that the bell rings. We both know that you're not the brightest bulb in the, in the shed here, but I want to reward you. I'm going to give you a car. How does a new company car sound? And Philip said, vroom, vroom. <laughs> Keep thinking. Keep thinking. Is wealth disparity a threat to our republic? Are the poor on the verge of revolt? This was a topic that came up on Facebook with some of my liberal friends. Yes, I know, you can't imagine that I have any friends, but I do, and some of them happen to be liberal. And we were having a fun time on Facebook debating this issue, and I am going to entertain you with some of what they had to say and some of what I had to say. Now, what evidence is there of protest, anger, and resistance right now? Why would this topic even come up? Well. Here's Kathy Lee Griffin with a beheading of Donald Trump. Here is Steve Scalise who was shot. He's a Republican, by the way. That's what that tiny R means. He was shot by a Bernie Sanders supporter not too long ago. Here's 500,000 women protesting gender, gender inequality the day after Trump was inaugurated. Here is a Central Park play where Trump was assassinated as Julius Caesar. Many of you are familiar with the Shakespeare play Julius Caesar. They had Donald Trump play that position so they could kill him in the middle of Central Park. Now on July 7, 2006, five Dallas policemen actually were shot and killed by a Black Lives Matter sniper. He belonged to Black Lives Matter, took measures into his own hands, decided to get those cops and kill him. Now, you guys also are familiar with what happened in Charlottesville. And here are some Antifa, which stands for anti-fascist, which means you're not supposed to think that violence is good. They're engaging in violence against those they don't like. And here's the National Socialists at Charlottesville. It's good to remember that that's what Nazi actually stands for. Not conservative, but National Socialists at Charlottesville. And then here you see the KKK racists who are also there. So there's ample opportunity for these guys to battle it out and fight. And this is just eight incidences that prove the point. There's a lot of assassination talk about Donald Trump and so forth that we've been having to deal with. 12,000 tweets in the last year. All right, economic advancement mitigates against anger. This is a great website, gapminder.org. And what this does is you can put in any of these different nations over here, the Green one is the United States. South Africa is this blue line. Yellow is Russia. And who do you think this one is? This is China. Now the size of these dots indicate the population, and that's why China is so big. And they start this from about 200 years ago. So each one of these little dots starts moving around as it starts heading. And what we're looking at here is a graph between life expectancy and years. So the further north you are on this graph, the longer you live in that society. And over here we have the income per person all the way out in this direction. So the further you are in this direction, the richer you are and the longer you live. And what you can see over time is we all started closer to this side. And as technology and innovation and medical care has improved, and as the wealth of our country has improved, the United States has shot with this many people, it's a pretty decent sized bubble, all the way out here to the far right. And there's very few other people who are even close to us. There are some nation states like Hong Kong or Marque or some of these others that are slightly to the right. But for the most part, we're the world's leader for that number of people. But you can see that the Chinese have sort of drifted around over time. And what these drifting around represent is war. Because war destroys. It destroys wealth and it destroys lives. So you'll see some dips and some rising that have to reflect war that has ravaged their countries. And that's why you see a lot of these dips and rises for Russia. Because Russia was absolutely destroyed during World War I and World War II by the Germans. And I thought I would put in 
this other country, South Africa, because they've had similar issues with the integration uh, of their demographics. They've, they've had, in this, in this little space here where they go up and around, that's where they had the revolt, where the blacks said we're being treated like slaves, we don't like being treated like slaves, we're going to overthrow the country unless you elect us and give us equal rights. And as a result, they got what they wanted, but the nation suffered some deaths and some loss of property and so forth. So this is really interesting because you can go and put in any one of these nations that you want and see how over 200 years they've actually moved in time and compare them with each other. But one of the things that I want to show here is that life is not a zero-sum game. Even these four disparate nations are moving in the far upper right corner. Maybe not all at the same time, maybe not as efficiently, but they're not stealing from each other in order to get ahead. And one of the big myths that people will try and tell you is that for one person to get ahead in this country or in the world, you have to take it away from somebody else. But that's not, in fact, the case. And we can prove that. So let's go to the next slide. Do you guys remember Microsoft computers when they used to look like this? Do you remember how you had to use a floppy disk? And before that, you actually had to use a tape recorder in order to be able to load stuff. And we were all so excited because we could play a game of Pong on the computer, and we'd never been able to do that before, and we thought it was the most exciting thing in the world. Well, obviously, we've advanced far beyond that. We've got a computer here that I'm using that is technologically advanced way beyond anything that was 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. And how does that happen? It happens because the rich people go out and spend too much money on the latest and newest thing. They overpay for it. And we can't afford to do that. Most of the people in this room can't afford it. But two or three or four years later, we can buy that because of the technological innovation that takes place because the rich are free with their money, overpay, and that gives the people who produce and manufacture these the signal, we need to ramp up production. We need to start paying people to do research and development. And by doing that research and development, by getting more and more volume, then they can make things for cheaper on a price per unit basis. So the rich are providing a great function for the rest of us. They're going off and advancing technology by overpaying for stuff that two or three years later we can afford. It's the same thing with computer screens. Many of you have big screen television sets at home. When they first came out, they were probably ten or twelve or fifteen thousand dollars. You couldn't afford to buy them, but some people could, and the people who went out and did it and bought it then provided programming for the rest of us. And as the price of those have fallen, we can now go out and buy a thousand dollar screen that covers half the wall. So we have benefited because others have been free with their money, and the rich have subsidized the manufacturing for the rest of us. It's the same thing with cellular telephones. When cellular telephones first came out, I sold cellular telephones at 60 cents a minute to rich doctors who needed to be able to handle an emergency. And that was back in 1985. And since then, the price per second of telephone usage has fallen to what? Less than, a, less than a, a cent per minute? Maybe like half a cent? All of that happens because everyone follows the bandwagon of the rich, crowds into the market, makes it more economical for technology to succeed in giving you a product that's manufactured for the masses. So these are two or three good examples of what I call economic justice. In the United States of America, the rich people are not stealing from us, they're trading with us. They're giving us something we want, whether it's a TV, whether it's a cell phone, whether it's a better computer. Nobody forces you to go buy it. Nobody forces you to dig into your wallet and pay them money for that. You choose. And if you choose not to, you don't have to. So that is a voluntary choice. You get more value out of the cell phone or the computer than the money you pay for it. And if you don't, then you don't buy it. Meanwhile, the manufacturer gets more value from what he sells, there gets more value from the money than what it costs him to make at a much lower price. So he benefits. Both parties benefit. It's a win-win trade. That basic concept I've talked about before, you guys know it, you live it every day if you sell a product or service. There's a lot of people in this country that have no concept that a trade benefits both parties. Hey Kiefer, can you come up here and try and help me with this while I continue to talk about this? Yeah, sure. Thank you. 
they actually did a study and they showed that the income taxes that we pay in our society are disproportionately paid for by the top 1%. The top 1% are making most of the money. They pay most of the taxes. Thank you, Kiefer. Appreciate it. So the welfare nanny state is a leviathan already. We're already paying way too much money to make everybody else love us. And when I say we, I mean the upper 1%. We've got Section 8 expenses. We've got massive military costs. We have, we have bread and butter and circuses for everybody and the masses in order to keep them happy. But the poor people don't necessarily see it. And they don't understand how much the rich are actually already paying. We have a progressive tax rate. And because of that progressive tax rate, the upper 1% of those who earn income pay 46% of the total cost. Now, if you look at this graph, this is a 2011 IRS tax returns and you have the top 2.4% paying 48.9% over here. This is the best graph I could get. But from the year 2011 to today, the top 1% is now actually up to 46%. And you can see that this is the percentage of the returns that are filed and the percentage of income tax that's actually paid. So if you're making less than $15,000, you're paying basically nothing. If you're making $30,000 to $49,000, you're only paying 4.5%. Not until you get up to about $50,000 to $100,000 are you paying 16% of your taxes, and then the number keeps going up. So we should keep that in mind when people want to raise your taxes and claim that they're not high enough. You just press the space bar. Yeah. It's a good thing I have Kiefer around at work so I can actually make some money. So, <laughs> during the days of Rome, when Julius Caesar was taking over the country, what did he offer people? Bread and circuses. If you've gone to a grocery store, store recently, you're overwhelmed by the variety of what you can choose. And if you want to keep yourself entertained, we've got Hollywood. We've got the best entertainment the world has ever seen. We export it, and even people who don't speak our languages are busy subtitling it all because they want to see what we have to give them. That keeps people happy. In addition to the Section 8 and the Medicare and the Medicaid and health and everything else that we give to people. So are the poor going to revolt anytime soon? Not with all of these goodies that are coming in. Another thing that mitigates against them getting angry is there's a high economic intergenerational mobility, which means poor people don't stay poor. They start moving up. They may start here in the lowest fifth percentile, but within a gen well, actually within 25 years, from 1969 to 1994, 59% of them moved up to the second level, the second fifth. And meanwhile, some of these rich people up here, these trust fund babies, they misspent all of their money. And 61% of them fell down to the fourth fifth. So you can see that there is a churning of income and wealth in our society. People don't just make money and stay rich, they spend it. And then they become poor if they don't know how to continue to make it. And the poor people get high quality public education, which allows them to go off and get a job. If they're smart enough, they can be a doctor or an accountant. And if they're dumb, they end up like a real estate broker. But they have the opportunity to rise or fall to whatever level they're capable of. I say there's little class prejudice in America, especially compared to other countries. We wouldn't have a black president if there was so much prejudice that we couldn't have overcome that and still voted him in. We have a higher gender equality than most other countries. There's acid attacks in the Middle East on women who have to wear complete veils over their heads right now. Here in America, the, the women might complain about not getting equal pay, but if it's within 15% and the men are doing the most dangerous jobs and therefore making more money, that explains most of the wealth gap. Fewer capital restrictions make opening a business easier. It's easier to start a business in this country. You don't have to get as many people approving a new place for you to move to. You don't have to get all of the next door neighbors to approve it. So it makes it easier to start a business and make wealth. You have a good idea. You have good credit. You have a lot of motivation. You have a good work ethic. You partner with other people who have the rest of that. And you can get a loan and you can start your own business and you can make the big bucks. And finally, strong title and property protection allow easier lending. That's the biggest problem if you go to a place like Mexico. 
you can't own property with good title down in Mexico. You have an attorney say that they think you own title based on whatever they've been able to research. But people down there lose title to their properties because there is no title insurance. And because there's no title insurance, you can't put 10% down and buy a property. You have to put 50 or 60% down. And when you try and go get a loan, you can't borrow 75 or 80% of it. You can only borrow 50% of it because you don't know what you have. You don't have that title insurance. Without having access to the money that's in property, you can't borrow on it, you can't make a good business, and you can't depend upon it. What's the sixth reason that mitigates against the poor people deciding to revolt? We have effective law enforcement with strong property right protections. Now this is a graph from 1650 all the way up till today, and you'll see this is the estimated long-term trend in American homicide rate, and this is a tax per 100,000 people. So you'll see that back in the 1700s you had about four times as many homicides as you have down today. That's a good long-term trend. The policemen in our country are doing their jobs, and they're doing it well. Now when the policemen aren't available to do their jobs, we also have a Second Amendment. And the Second Amendment means that a good number of the people in this room own a gun or a shotgun. They can defend themselves, if necessary, when the police aren't around to do it. That deters criminals from breaking into your home, raping and ravaging your kids, and deciding to steal all of your wealth. Finally, we have another deterrent that a lot of the secular humanists in our society downplay or don't mention. We have a good, solid, religious populace who keeps the Ten Commandments and keeps a reverence for the order and peace that they actually experience at church when they go to church. And what are some of the Ten Commandments that protect us? Well, let's see. Honor thy mother and thy father. That always comes in handy when I argue with my children. I use that about once a day. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery, because adultery is stealing your wife or somebody else's wife, which leads to people killing you. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not bear false witness, and finally you shall not envy or covet thy neighbor's house, wife, or possessions. If we could all adhere to these, we'd all be a lot happier and safer as a result. But a good number of us do most of the time, which is why we are as safe as we are. Now some people don't like how much money the CEOs make in this country and they always like to do some math and say well the CEOs making a thousand times more than the guy who's busy as a janitor in there and doing what he's doing. But I will point out to you that CEOs like rock stars, like Hollywood stars, like quarterbacks are paid on the basis of performance. If they don't perform they're fired. This is a CEO's performance. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 1800 all the way up till today. And the people who are making money are not just the CEOs who are being paid these big salaries, but the stockholders. And the stockholders, when they're happy, they take the, tell the board of directors, keep the CEO, pay him to stay, don't let the competition grab him. And just like there's only 32 quarterbacks in the NFL who can hit somebody with a ball in the middle of their chest, 40 or 50 yards downfield while somebody's trying to bloody them up and smash them into the ground and puncture their lungs, that's a pretty tough thing to find as a quarterback who stays around and can do that sort of thing. And so they're paid a bunch of money. They're paid 10, 20 million dollars a year. They're paid a bunch of money. CEOs who can make us money if we own stock are also given what competition gives them. What they ask for and what they get because the competition is willing to pay them the same. So if you really don't like how well CEOs are making all this money, go buy some of their stock. Jump on their coattails. Ride along with them. Finally, the tenth reason why I doubt the poor are going to revolt anytime soon is because trickle-down economics really does work. The people who are in charge of these companies, they create jobs. They create them. And here is a statistic from the National Bureau of Economic Research. Indeed, grouped in traditional ways, businesses tend to create jobs in proportion to their importance in the economy. Thus, large mature firms, those more than 10 years old and with more than 500 workers, 
employed about 45% of all private sector workers and accounted for almost 40% of job creation and destruction in this study. The rich who run these countries have the ability to leave the United States and go to Switzerland or Germany or any other place that they want to run to. If they're allowed to have property here and keep it and feel safe about it, they will make us rich also. And they will trade us things that we want to own, whether it's computers, whether it's great entertainment, whether it's the NFL. That's what they give to us. That's what we like receiving. That's what we're willing to trade for. And the alternative is they take those somewhere else, and we're all unemployed. Fellow Toastmasters.